right, cheers, everybody. Cheers, baby. Welcome to The Water Cooler. The Water Cooler is a show about marketing, sales, and technology. Each episode, we focus on bringing you advice that works. Nearly a year ago, a little over a year ago, we had, we had uh, the gentleman we have on today's podcast, Phil M. Jones, join us. Uh, we're sort of celebrating our year anniversary from the, from the publishing of our yes. best-selling book, yes. Exactly What to Say. I, I saw this recently, Chris. Yeah. The, book, the book now has almost 400 reviews on Amazon, right? Wow. Couple, a couple more hundred on Audible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it, it's sort of rising the ranks right now in terms of the feedback, the popularity, the success of the book. So, you know, we're incredibly grateful for everyone who's helped support the book. We're incredibly grateful for those of you who, who have given us reviews and feedback on Amazon and Audible. And we're excited about today's conversation because we're bringing Phil M. Jones back on the water cooler to talk about conversations that convert, how to help you guys make some small changes to the strategies, the techniques, the tactics in your everyday sales conversations to get better results. But Chris, I want to start today's podcast by giving the audience and our fans and our community here a little bit of background behind how Curator, how Chris and Jimmy and Phil M. Jones got connected in the world. Yeah, well, I'll tell the quick version. So like almost a million other people, I was able to get a copy of Phil's book, Exactly What to Say, The Magic Words for Impact and Influence. Mm -hmm. And I got the audible version. So I had this soothing British guy in my ear and it's like an hour. How long yeah. is it, Phil? It's like two 70, hours. 73 minutes. Yeah, it's like shorter than a movie, which I was like, you know, that's probably part of the reason it's the most listened to business book on Audible because it's, it's quick. But man, there was so much meat on the bone. So I ended up taking all these notes as I'm listening and I was able to connect the dots really quickly between the advice he gave and how we could turn those magic words into things that would help our sales team. So I coached our sales team right away. They loved it. Mm -hmm. We hit up Phil and said, hey, will you come speak at our conference? Wrote him a big check. He came to Boston. He gets up there and performs and blew the audience away. I mean, we've had some great speakers over the years at Excellence. Mm -hmm. And I believe Phil is the first and only one to get a standing ovation from like 700 people. So that pissed me off a little bit. <laughs> but it was it was earned. Yeah. And then we got together and we said, you know what? Like, we need to apply the magic words and, and sort of this, this movement that you've created, the real estate industry is very specific. It's very niche, the terminology, the lingo. Mm -hmm. And we decided to put our brains together, bring our knowledge of real estate with his knowledge of sales. And like you mentioned, it's been a home run. Uh, we brought our clients into Boston. We did a workshop. The thing that we did that I think that was smart is, and this was, you know, based on Phil's advice, we identified the most common, critical, and difficult situations agents face today. Mm -hmm. We started with that. And then we worked backwards into like, okay, how can some of these phrases and how can some of this logic apply to those situations? And just one quick sidebar. Uh, as I was listening to Phil's book, one of my favorite sets of magic words was, are you open-minded mm -hmm. to blank? Are you open-minded to paying full commission? Are you open-minded to signing up for Curator this week? You can use it a million ways. Well, I went into a gym in Orlando and we were considering working with other industries at that time and fitness was one of the industries. So I just walked in there and I started talking to the guy and I said, hey, you know, my name's Chris. I wrote this book and, you know, we do Facebook ads and we can help you with your marketing, help you get your gym, you know, at capacity. And this lady in the back, she kept saying, yeah, right. And she was like, we already tried that. It doesn't work for us. But she was like, literally, I couldn't see her. She was like in an office or something. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking to the guy and he was being really nice. She kept throwing these bombs from the back of the gym. So I said, sir, obviously she's not open-minded to hearing us out. We're going to take off. And she came running out of the office and she said, I am open-minded. So you have to use these words very carefully <laughs> yes, uh, or else you can get yourself in trouble. But the reality is the thing, and I said this in the email that we invited people to the show. I think Phil is the best salesperson I've ever met. 
I think he's probably one of the best salespeople on the planet. And it's not just because he's great at sales. He does it as a, with morals and ethics and class. You know what I'm saying? Because you can be really good at sales and be really sleazy and annoying, right? Like, and Phil just, he embodies class and he's good at sales. So that's the backstory. It's been a great relationship. Some would call it a bromance. <laughs> well, Phil, it's, it's a, it, it, I think what you were just describing there, Chris, is Phil embodies what it means to be a professional. Yep. We talked about this in the book, a professional salesperson. So Phil, let me ask you a first question here. Before we dive into some of the ideas and concepts today, talk to me about what you've learned about the real estate industry. You've worked with many other industries, but in the last year, year and a half since we've been working together, geez, two years now, yeah. you really have immersed yourself in this industry and they, and they have welcomed you with open arms. So talk to us about what you've learned about what it's like to work in the real estate industry. Okay, there's a big question. What's it like to work in the real estate industry? What have I learned? Well, let me give you some good sides and some bad sides to things that I've learned. And we'll start with the bad news first. Is the bad news about the bulk of the real estate industry is it's so short-sighted. Mm -hmm. Like it wants to do a thing today that creates an outcome today that gets them paid yesterday. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't do that, then like forget about it. Add to that another piece of bad news is the to lean into some of Donald Miller's type work is that so many people in the world of real estate want to be the hero of the story. Like my listing, I did, I sold, we're awesome. All this version of like blowing smoke up their own backside. I see so much of that in the industry as a whole and, and a lack of integrity. Then the flip of that is there's this like more than a handful of people who are the complete opposite of that. That what they are is that they are heart-centered people that really give a damn, not about their clients, but the families that they serve and the results that they create. And then I've seen some of the most masterful small business community leadership that I've seen in any industry within teams that are created within real estate. Mm -hmm. And I think there's this knowledge of, I'm not contractually employing this person. I'm not like holding them to ransom with a paycheck that I'm sending them month in, month out. Therefore, what they create through culture, through training, through learning and development, through genuine leadership has been some of the best I've seen in the world, like outperforming FTSE 500 companies, outperforming like yeah, Inc. 50, Inc 50, like all of that, just masterful leadership on a micro level through teams within real estate. Mm -hmm. and, and then you add to that the fact that this is a never ending job. Like almost everybody you do business with at some point in time in the future will likely need yours or somebody like you service again at some point in the future. Plus they know dozens or hundreds of other people that need it. And some people get that and some people are completely blind to that. And I think you've got a classic example like many industries where the barrier to entry is low and the potential reward is so high that you've got a whole spectrum of levels of professionalism mm -hmm. from the very best to the very worst within a stone throw of each other. Um, and too often it gets into that bragging match of my dad's better than your dad um, in a smaller side, which for me is an opportunity for open water for quality agents to really go out and, and make name for themselves. So that's, my executive summary of the real estate industry in a nutshell once put on the spot. So you well, think well, it's no, what's so fascinating about what you said there is <clears throat> there is a clear divide divide. I think that our audience understands that because the people who fall into the to the the former, the bucket that's just short sighted, they don't watch podcasts like the water cooler, right? It's the people who fall into the latter, people who want to improve upon their 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 own individual skills and, and try to get better every day. But what, what happens is, and, and I want to get your reaction to this as well, Chris, I find that those individuals find themselves having to figure out ways to shout louder than the, than the ones who are doing things the wrong way. So when you think about that, Chris, I know we're going to get into sales and talk specifically about tactics and tactics and scenarios here, but I think this does relate to sales. Like mm -hmm. how, how, does an, how do these professionals stand out in the way they interact with customers when they have to like, when they have to like rise above that noise that exists in their, in our industry. It's easy. It's easy to stand out when so many people suck. Mm. 
and you don't. I think about this because I know it's frustrating. You know, I know that two or three out of every 10 real estate agents truly cares. Seven, six, eight of them. They're in it for the check. They're in it for the money. They're not, it's not really their passion. But why would that be a bad thing? Now, I, I am sorry for the consumer mm -hmm. who has to experience that. But if I'm Jessica Woodbeck, if I'm Connie Carlson, if I'm Amy Youngren, mm -hmm. I'm, it doesn't really, it isn't really the worst thing in the world that 80% of my industry is laughable and terrible at what they do because that makes my pedestal higher. Yeah. And I don't think you even that. have to push them down. You don't have to knock them off their pedestal. You can just be who you are. And by default, I remember we were at a conference one time and this, this is something that comes up a lot where it's like, how do you get so many five-star reviews? How do you, how do you get people to leave you a review? And it's like, you, you give them a reviewable experience. Mm -hmm. It's not about some template that you send afterwards or some magic word that you drop towards the end of the process. You create a remarkable experience that's repeatable for everybody that you work with. So it's the gift and the curse, you know, but here's the, the truth. If somebody worked with a realtor that sucked and you're great and then they work with you, you almost get the benefit that the other person was so bad. Well, let me, let me, let me throw something out there. And this is, this is going to be for you, Phil, though. Cause, so I agree with what you're saying, Chris, but I, what I'm really speaking to is consumers coming to the, starting the re relationship with a preconceived notion because mm -hmm. of the poor performance of the industry. So, so like, I, I guess the first, and this is going to be maybe our first sales question, Phil, which is when you're where, when you're in an industry that is synonymous with some of the adjectives that real estate is. Yep. How, how, how might one, in, in the form of a conversation, immediately try to convey or communicate that, to your point, Chris, we're not like the other guys? Mm -hmm. it's, it's simple but not easy is how do you do that. And, Jimmy, you, you, this is going out on video as well as on audio, correct? Yeah. So, are, oh, are you going you gonna to whip out the... Uh, I'm going to, yeah, it might show something because I think sometimes it's easier to show and not tell. But, um, and the mistake that almost everybody makes when an industry is, is prejudged the wrong way is they want to show up with a version of, I know, or let me tell you that you're wrong. Before they've even understood what the other person's opinion is in the first place, it's let me tell you all the things that you should be thinking, might be thinking, and why you should be thinking blank. Right, like that is the starting point for many in an industry that's already believing it's on the back foot. I think what you should decide ahead of time is that the people that you're speaking to aren't necessarily prejudging you. They're not necessarily prejudging you, but they might be. And I think that possibility that they're prejudging you is more important than the decision that they are. And what it means is that in every conversation that you go into, you have to be starting from a position of curiosity. Now, I teach this model all the time right now of giving people the three key ingredients that go into every critical conversation, but they're never more important than they are for the world of conversion when somebody's making a high stakes decision on who to trust with something like buying or selling a home. And by curiosity in this context, I mean, understand their context. Now you have an abundance of content around why you are the number one choice in your provider for the thing that you're offering. Always you have a wealth of content. You understand this is that your content without context is merely noise and the world is already noisy enough. So you inserting more noise into a noisy situation doesn't create clarity, actually creates uncertainty. So if your goal is to create certainty in somebody else, you show up with curiosity to get you to certainty. Now, what does that look like in a real estate world? Well, why don't you start with big, broad, open questions like, well, what is your experience with buying and selling homes? You see how if you just start there, what is your experience of buying, selling homes? And they say, well, um, you know, we, we, we tried to put this on the market nine months ago, had a terrible experience. You say, tell me some more about that. And they tell you some more about that. You say, well, what did you like best about the person you chose? They say nothing. You say, what would you change about it? They say this. 
You say, well, why are you speaking to me? And they say, because I heard this, this and this about you. Like what's that done to your confidence before you've even got into any form of masterclass of these are all the reasons why I'm awesome? Mm -hmm. Because you were curious for long enough to understand their context. What pros then do is they move from curiosity to empathy, hugely talked about quality that nobody understands. What is empathy? Seeing things from another person's point of view. It is that simple. Put yourself in the context of somebody selling their home. That's a big decision. It's certainly a significant decision to who to trust with this. The consequences of this decision could be more than just financial. The experience, the service, the communication, we're going to have to speak on a regular basis. You're in my house. You're looking in my daughter's bedroom, right? Like these things are real things. So if you fail to see it from the other person's point of view, you, my friends, are an a-hole, right? Like that is the reality of it, is that we have to be empathetic enough. Why? Because you want to be relatable. And you're not relatable unless you've been curious enough first. Like it has to be in that order. Mm -hmm. So even questions like, well, what do you understand about the process? What is your experience with? Help me understand. These simple prefaces allow the other person to scene set for you. They paint the picture that you're going to insert yourself in. Instead, you say, take a look at my picture. Look at my picture. Isn't it pretty? What I want them to do is to paint their picture that I'm going to plant myself in in a minute as the ideal choice. And then behind empathy, we have courage, right? Courage is what comes next. And courage, again, is a giant missing ingredient. People aren't brave enough to ask. That's what I mean by courage, not climb a mountain courage, go to war courage, fight somebody courage. I mean, the courage to just ask. Mm -hmm. Because that gives you the ability to get the actions that you're looking for. So in terms of where to start, knowing that people are possibly going to be prejudging you, understand their context, see the world through their eyes, and then ask the questions that you need to ask to be able to give yourself a layup. Mm. Like we're not trying to shoot for three points here. It is as easy enough to be able to get the layup or walk away, which is equally empowering, right? You do this right, you find out, oh dang, it's not me they're looking for. They should go Redfin. Right? Like that's where they should go or whatever it might be because they're not a fit. And that's what impacts your confidence as a professional in the real estate space is starting with that curiosity, moving to empathy, and then having the courage to ask what you really need. Chris, how do you think that differs from the way, Phil, first off, you're the first guest we've ever had the water cooler who's been able to pull the side by side up and draw. So kudos to you. But Chris, how do you think that compares to the way a normal real estate conversation goes? So Phil, pull that back up for us if you could. Yeah, sure. Side yeah. by side. Yeah, so I think what, what most people do in the curiosity line of the triangle is they say, what's your time frame for moving? They say, what's your budget? They say, have you been qualified for a loan yet? <laughs> they say, what features are you looking for in your next home? Mm -hmm. uh, they it's very mechanical because um, they're obviously like there's questions that you have to ask that are, I guess what you would kind of think is the X's and O's. Like we need to know your time frame for moving. Mm -hmm. We need to know your budget for your next purchase. I don't think people defaultly would ask, what was your last experience like? Help me understand you know, what your experience was like the last time you bought a home. Because as Phil said that, I was thinking, I bet if you were to ask that, because we always default to the negative. Yeah. But I bet there's a lot of people you would ask that say, yeah, when we lived out in California, I worked with this lady named Susie and she was amazing. Right. What were like, some oh, of the things that she did that were amazing? Yeah. What What made her amazing? I want to be amazing. She available after hours and that she would mm -hmm. text me as opposed to send everything in an email and she'd complete the forms ahead of time. So all I needed to do was to put my moniker where it needed to be. Like they give you, like people are easy to sell to because they'll give you their blueprint. Yeah. And it's it's really what I call digging deep. You know, the the deeper you dig, and I think Phil, the way you say it is that questions create Conversations. Conversations, conversations, create relationships, relationships, create opportunities. Yeah. And then only opportunities can deliver your sales. Exactly. 
And so if I'm like, even with the calls that we do, Jimmy, for curator, it's like, you know, tell me how many people are on your team. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. What, what, like, what's your current technology? Mm -hmm. You know, how long have you been in the industry? Mm -hmm. You know, those don't feel like empathy or curiosity. They feel like they came off of a piece of paper. And, and here's the base principle behind it is we have to do past, present and future. What most people do is present and future. You see, if I haven't done past, then we're not in this thing together. So you want to ask how many employees and what software, et cetera, but you've got to go to the history first. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the company. What is it that you've been looking to achieve? Who founded it? How long have you been running? Like, like that's the stuff that I want to be running first. So what's your experience with working with different marketing vendors? Like that stuff now opens them up in a, in a completely different way. Now let's even take this to a buyer seller scenario. If I was walking in to win a listing appointment, one of the early questions that I would always love to ask is say, what are some of the things that were surprising about you once you owned this home that you didn't realize at the time that you purchased it? Mm -hmm. Like the house that we just bought here in Florida, we have a giant front porch that I didn't consider for a second would be valuable to me at the time that I bought it. It's now our favorite room in the house. Mm -hmm. Like if the agent would have made more of a feature on that, I might've been happy to pay more for the house, but they didn't, you know, like finding those gems that exist that would sit outside of the typical listing. But what else do they do? They show that you care about what it's like to live in a home. Mm -hmm. These are little things that will give you a fair advantage because everybody makes it so much about the fee, about what percentage you're going to charge, but nobody says, well, actually, where are the marketable assets within this house that we can help bring to the front of somebody else's mind to make sure we maximize the value? They say we'll maximize the value because we'll get it in front of more people and we'll create more eyeballs and the, what we'll do is drive a bidding more upwards. But they don't say, let's find the little gems in here that are hugely valuable that most other real estate agents would miss. Mm -hmm. Because those are the things that will help us maximize your home. And, and this is what I'd look for is how do you be marketplace of one? And you do it by being curious. And what's beautiful about being curious is you can't get it wrong. Mm -hmm. What he said there, I was thinking, Jimmy, is I would have said, man, if he would have been the agent and left, I would have told my wife, like, he really cared about our house. Right. Like, he really cared. It was obvious how much that he cared. You see how you take it one stage further, though, Chris, is you then say, so what are some of the things about this house that have caused you some frustrations that have mean that you want to move? Mm -hmm. Like, what has this house taught you that you want to learn from in the next purchase that you make? And what are you trying to get at here, though? So you're asking these questions. Yes, you're being curious, right? And yes, you're doing so to be empathetic. You're doing so to sort of have the courage to basically get some action here. But what do you try, like when you're asking those questions, what is the route in which you're driving towards? Because I'm looking to be able to say, hey, remember the fact that you said that one thing that's remarkably important to you is that when you wake up in the morning that you have a view to look at, that your bed has something that isn't looking at a wall, that isn't looking at a closet, that is actually looking at something with some depth for it. Yeah. I think I've just found a house. It's slightly outside of area. It's a bit more than what you were looking to pay, but the view from the bedroom is killer and I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't show it to you. What's happening in their mind when that scenario plays out? I listened. Mm -hmm. but you see how I bank it. Like all you're doing is you're collecting little things in your back pocket being like at a point in time, if I'm looking to be able to help someone buy a home, there's a point I'm going to have to ask them to compromise. And most people have to ask them to compromise on the back foot. They tell them I can find you perfect. And then later I have to undo that promise and say, I can't find you perfect. So where are we going to? like deal with the imperfections. Yeah. If I collect the potential imperfections first, I can act in their interest, which is being one step ahead of them. And the most mm -hmm. important thing that anybody wants for in any agent in any industry, one step ahead. Mm -hmm. Like Jimmy, you'd love it as a business owner if your broker for insurance purposes reached out to you ahead of time and says, hey, given the world, that, you know, the way the world has changed and that people are working from these environments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, one thing that you should probably be aware of is you need blank, blank, and blank insurance that you didn't need previously. You're like, thank you. Everybody finds insider information, absolutely. And so let's let's take this concept though. Let's, let's, let's bring it to the very practical level, which is 
common conversations that happen, common and, and difficult conversations that happen every day within real estate. So this framework that you're laying out right now, curiosity, empathy, and courage, let's apply that for something as simple as uh, prospecting. Now, mm -hmm. there are common ways in which our industry prospects. And Chris, I want you to break that down for us. Like the most common ways that our clients and other clients in this industry are out there trying to drum up new business. Give us sort of just maybe the top three that come to mind. Yeah. So one of them, Phil, would be, you know, calling a lead that they generated online. Could be a Facebook lead, a Zillow lead, a Google lead, a website lead. So, you know, there's the internet lead bucket. There is the expired listing bucket. There is the FISBO for sale by owner yeah. bucket. And then I would say the other bucket is, you know, calling the people that you've already worked with, like calling your past clients, calling your sphere of influence uh, and, you know, keeping in touch but, you know, with the end game of drumming up more business or at least staying top of mind yep. uh, if they happen to be doing something soon. But I think for our audience, Jimmy, you know, Internet leads, Phil, here's what happens. There's a certain level of agent that they don't like the Internet leads. They've tried it. It doesn't work for them it's not really the kind of business they want to run. They don't want to have to hire an inside salesperson. They don't want to have to call a hundred people to get one or two appointments. They'd rather work their clients network. But the, the reality is that the top teams in this industry that have grown dramatically over the last decade have invested heavily in internet lead generation. Yep. But it's, it's, it can be hard. Somebody's on Facebook, they click, they register, they view a property all of a sudden, you know, Joe Realtor's calling them up, trying to see if they want to go look at a property soon. So yeah. if you could address that one uh, to start, that'd be great. Yeah, for sure. And is, firstly, I would say it's okay to decide that you don't want to get after internet leads. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. they're a bad idea. You can just decide it's not for you. Just like thousands of talented chefs have decided they don't want to try and make it in the big leagues. They go out and work in a country pub somewhere where there's no, you know, there's no real race. There's no real pressure. Like that's a choice you can make. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean internet bit leads are a bad idea. It just means that like it was too hot in that kitchen for you to be able to operate in it. You wanted an easier life. But if you want incremental wins, it is a necessary area to be able to play. In. What we have to understand, though, is that the qualification process of an internet lead is different to the qualification process of a past client saying, hey, can I go and see a house? Mm -hmm. Or somebody coming through on your listing saying, I'd like to go view that property. Like it's mm -hmm. a very different type of lead. It means they're further back in the buying process. Mm -hmm. Now, your goal in this model here is actually all about gaining trust. That's what we're really looking to be able to do is to gain trust. So in an internet lead scenario, we want to be curious. What can we be curious about that is the easiest thing for them to be able to answer? Our goal is small talk, but purposeful small talk that allows an exchange in conversation. If you think about the game of tennis, if you've ever played tennis with somebody, before you start keeping score, sometimes you have a simple rally, right? You just knock the ball backwards and forwards over the net a few times. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to do that with an internet lead while still being useful. And the easiest way to be useful in small talk is to talk about something they understand. The thing they always understand is their current circumstances. So my place to start with curiosity with an internet lead would be about where they're living right now. Mm -hmm. It's not what is your address? It's where are you living right now? Mm -hmm. How long have you been there? How soon are you looking to move? Yet what happens is everybody makes it about the house. And it shouldn't be about the house. It should be about the person. Mm -hmm. And what we have to find is their motivation for change. Now, is it okay to be on the internet browsing for houses you might be interested in buying in three years' time? Yeah. Because we all do it in some way, shape, or form, right? We all play that hypothetical set of circumstances of what if. So we have to make that okay. Even though if we stumble across it, we can then do that with integrity and realize there are no not today, but their circumstances might change. They might know 15 other people that are looking for help, et cetera. So we just want to understand their circumstances. 
it means that we can even dive into it to say, so the house that you click through on the information for, is that something that's within the budget of you being able to move forward with, or was it just something that caught your eye? You see how it's a gateway question where what I'm showing is I don't mind which one they pick. Just tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. But I'm asking for the truth without pushing them. If you were to go see this property, would you want to do it virtually or would you rather go in person? Mm -hmm. You see how what I'm doing is I'm in the play space. I'm purposefully in this hypothetical conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying are you pre-qualified? How many bedrooms have you got? Can you afford it? I'm just dancing around their set of circumstances. And what this is doing is it's allowing them to be able to build trust. And by starting there, what happens is they start to give clues. Mm -hmm of, well, you know, like my, my husband works Monday through Friday. So if we did go, it needs to be an evening or a weekend. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you want to see this before the open house so that you got a chance to be able to get in before a majority of others that if you did like it, then you could make an offer before you're up against multiple others? Well, yeah, I'd like to be able to do that. So what if I told you the open house was Sunday? Would you be looking for an evening this week or Saturday morning? What would suit you best? Mm-hmm. What do you think you could get us in Saturday morning? Yeah, how early would you be looking to go? Or well, somewhere like 9 a.m., let me see what I can do. But it's all done with their interest. Instead, what many agents do is they just dance around it. Mm -hmm. They try to be helpful, but actually they end up not being helpful because it's like that shop assistant set that comes up to you and says, can I help you? And you're like, I don't believe you can. I really don't believe you can. I know exactly what I need. I do not know where it is. I've never been in this store before in my life, but I do not believe that you can help me get there faster than I can on my own. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens with a lot of agents because they're not curious enough. Yeah. What's the difference between a good sales question and a great sales question? Because one question you just said there that just that, that, and it was more of a, an, an offer or a invite, if you will, and I, and I love this and I hope, our, I hope our audience wrote this down. Do you want to see this before the open house? That's, that's what I would consider to be a great question because it kind of creates some, some scarcity, kind of gives them the insider information, speaks directly to what they want. When you think about sort of maybe just more from a principles standpoint, Phil, the difference between a good sales question and a great sales question, where does your mind go? So here's a typical approach to questions, right? Build a funnel to drive towards the close that says, I ask a big question, then I ask a detailed question. Then what I do is I ask like a gateway question. And then what I do is I close where everything is moving like in an equal focus downwards. Here's what I do by alternative is I ask questions that are big, broad and wide in its entirety and then we nip into like a guaranteed close at the end. And look, I just drew a nipple on the screen on purpose, but like a badly shaped one. But what I'm saying is we want like a wide funnel that yeah. nips in tight at the end, not like this funnel of questions that comes in like this. Like I want a hundred pieces of evidence all in here that I'm collecting. Then once I've collected all the evidence I need, judge and jury, it's like, here's the obvious choice. Mm -hmm. So what is a good question? A good question is something that gives me a fundamental piece of evidence that creates truth for my later recommendation. And I'm collecting those evidences. So this piece of evidence here in this example is they want to see it before the open house. Mm -hmm. This piece of evidence over here is they've got nothing to sell. This piece of evidence here is that their brother-in-law is a mortgage advisor. Mm -hmm. This piece of evidence over here is that their lease expires in April. You with me, as I start collecting those, I say, hey, I think what we should look to be able to do is, yes, we could do Saturday morning, but I think if we can get there Friday night, then they're not even prepping for the open house. And if you do like it, then your offer is going to carry more weight. Would that make sense? Yeah, that would make sense. Do you think Hubby could get off work early? Well, yeah, he could probably be done by four. So if we could get a five o'clock appointment, would that make more sense for you to potentially be able to make this work? They say, yeah, sure. Instead, what many agents would say is, well, look, this is going to be a really popular listing. It's in the prime area on the open house kicks in. There's likely to be dozens of offers that are on this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I really recommend that you get towards it right now. And you're pushing your opinion on this. Mine is give me all the evidence, all the evidence to being like, why on earth would you wait till the open house? That would be stupid. 
Like, so the obvious choice is to be able to come back in the other direction. Is that, does that make sense about a good question? And I think too many people want this killer question. Like that one question gets you there. Whereas my approach is like, I'm just collecting evidence. Yeah. And I think that metaphor of being like a criminal prosecution lawyer, well, what I'm doing is getting all the evidence from all the witnesses that I need before I turn to jury means that I have higher levels of conversion than I ever would do than shoot too early with a he, she did it and then deal with all the objections and then try and find myself in a tussle. Because we've all seen this in real estate more often than not is that you've been right and not got the right result. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the other person didn't enjoy the fight. Whereas I turn it into a dance and they're like, that was fun. You know what, you know, what else you could do there, Jimmy, is because there's not an open house every weekend, but I think you could use the same logic that like most people go and look at properties on the weekend. Would you be open minded to going and looking at it before everybody else goes and sees it on Saturday and Sunday? You know, same concept, just because there's not always an open. But look at the gateway question first. Mm -hmm. Hey, did you want to see basically what I'm saying is, do you want to see this before everybody else or do you want to be in with the masses? Mm -hmm. I'd like to better see it before everybody else so now the open house is not an option yeah what i'm really leaning into is the secret to successful sales isn't embellishing the option of yes it's destroy the option of no mm -hmm. and I, I would go one step further on that phil and something that you've taught us at curator and it's something that's always resonated with me chris anderson who is the former i think editor at wired magazine said we are moving from an age of information to an age of recommendation Mm -hmm. And what you're describing through this process as we're walking through this is that you're earning the right. Correct. A recommendation. And I think yeah. that, that, that's, that's essentially maybe the, when I think about a, a great sales conversation, it is that sort of fundamental piece, earning a right. Um, let's, let's maybe go a little bit further here down the, the, the journey here of a sale, a typical sales conversation. Let's get into the actual part of the sales conversation, which is, um, the qualifying stage because you know you we, if we're opening up the conversation and we're being curious but we know we have to get answers to the questions that we we need to check those boxes how would you maybe approach that in a way that doesn't feel like you were saying earlier chris robotic or mechanical or we're just using a script because people they want to be empathetic but they also don't want to be driving around unqualified buyers right. Right? To, to see see they don't want to become an uber you know for real estate so so talk us through that if you could well i'm going to push back at you for a second and say okay what are we looking to qualify what is what is the evidence you're looking to try and gather within that qualification process if i'm a busy real estate agent i, I think there's a few things i'm looking for number one i'm looking for is this person looking are they is, is this person in a position to make a decision okay All right uh, I'm, I'm looking to know, um, are they working with other agents? Are they monogamous? Are they open to monogamy? Are they, are they out there dating other agents? Because I, I don't want to be showing someone, some other agent's clients homes. Uh, so I want to, I want to ask, I want to like, do you have an agent, right? That's what, that's yeah. what you want to ask. Um, do they have the capacity? Meaning, so, so decision maker, am I the only agent? Do they have the capacity to buy a property? Right? Are you, you are you pre-qualified? These these are I, I would say three of the more common ones you would run into. Okay, can you afford it? Are you going to work with me, me, and only me? And by capacity, do you mean money or bandwidth and time? No, when I, when I, when I, capacity capacity was can you afford it? When I say when I say are you decision making? Is it you? Is it you and your spouse? Like, are you the one actually making the decision here? Because I want to be talking to the person who's actually going to like give me the green light. I think oftentimes uh, we see this a lot when it's a when it's a, 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 a situation when there's two uh, buyers, right? Uh, spouses, um, like you're communicating primarily to one, and then that person is taking the information you're giving them, filtering it to their spouse. Yeah, the spouse is actually the one making the decision. Okay. I think you could almost break it down, Phil, to like, are you serious, and are you serious soon? <laughs> like the reality is that that's who agents want to work with serious sure. people who are going to do something soon. And the serious people who are going to do something soon are the ones that you get through reputation after time and experience of being in the role, the much of the pre-qualification work has been done through reputation or friend of a friend. 
Mm -hmm. like you do not need Phil Jones sales skills to be able to help influence those people because they were pre-influenced through the great work that you've done. Actually, where our work really comes into play is that giant pot of people in the middle. Sure, we'd love to be able to spend all day every day doing layups, but I haven't met anybody on the planet at any level of profession and any level of expertise that spends all day every day with all the easy ones, even if that is their desire or goal. Mm -hmm. So the messy middle is, is where growth is. That's where the profit is. So I can't make life easier. I can just help you have an easier life in the scrappier conversations. What are you looking to be able to find out? Can you afford it? Are you loyal? And who else is involved in the decision-making process? Mm -hmm. Can you afford it? Are you loyal? Who else is involved? So we got to start by asking some questions that don't feel like that. Like think about a first date as if somebody was at a first date and said, are you interested in marriage and, kid, marriage and kids? Like, like before we order appetizers, mm -hmm. you know, I want three babies, right? Um, like it, it can feel like it's too much too soon to be able to get there. Like they are allowed to date you as the agent as well. Mm. But there is a two way street here in terms of the qualification is like, you're looking for potential, not certainty that you're going to be all of these things. Mm -hmm. So where do I come at it from, from a prequel core point of view is, is, you know, what is your experience of working with a professional real estate agent? What do you understand about what it means to work with a professional buyer's agent? What's the typical answer to those kind of questions? Well, for a lot of the clients who are tuning, tuning in right now, it, maybe they're working first time home buyers. They're gonna say, I have no experience. Okay. Or, or more accurately, if they've been bought a house, it's probably been a while. You know, yeah. people buy a mattress every seven years. They buy a property every like seven years, right? It, there's a long period of time. Like think about yep. the world seven years ago, Chris. Like what was popular seven years ago? Jeez, 2013? I'm trying to think. It's a long time. Right? It's, it's a lifetime ago. So see, see, this is where I'm going to start. I, I, I want to win the I'm your agent possibility first in that list of three things I'm trying to prove. Mm -hmm. I want to win the affordability argument second. And then I want to win the who else answer last. That's the order that I'm going to stack this qualification in. So I'll start with what is your experience? Boom, boom, boom. I'll get a version of I have limited experience, right? That's almost certainly going to be the case. Mm -hmm. To which you say, would it help if? Would it help if I walked you through exactly what you get from working with a professional buyer's agent like myself? Well, yeah, that'd be super helpful. See, before I do so, how much time have you spent hunting around on Zillow, hunting around on online searches, et cetera, to try and find you the perfect property when there could have been other things you've been doing with your time? Mm -hmm. Oh man, we've poured hours into that, et cetera. How confident do you feel that should you find something that you're looking for, that you're best positioned to be able to navigate that negotiation in the right way for all of the things that go into you being able to secure that home? Also, once the home is secured in that offer, how would you feel if you knew that you had somebody holding your hand all the way through that transaction, including inspections, including contracts, including title companies, including securing a finance if necessary to make sure that not only do you get to the finish line, that you're happy when you get to the finish line. How would you feel if that was true? Yeah, mm -hmm. feel awesome. Well, that's just the way that we do things here. And what I'd be looking for is if we're going to do this work for you right now in terms of being able to find availability on these properties, I just need some confidence from you that you're happy to work with a professional buyer's agent. Mm -hmm. To which they say, well, yeah, or how does that work? Mm -hmm. Right? To which you explain, well, the good news is at this point in time that there is no money that changes hands. You know, I'm paid a percentage of my fee once we find you the perfect house. So should we don't, you know, should we succeed in this, then this will work out well for both of us. And if for any reason that I let you down, then there is little to no risk to yourself. Does that sound fair? They say, yes. You say, so you know what that means is that means that all of your conversations, all of your negotiations, all of your future appointments for property in the so-and-so area, that comes through me. Can we agree to that? They say, yes. Zoom in on the word fair for me for a moment. What's so powerful about that word? I don't know anybody who doesn't want to be that. People might want things to be unfair in their favor, 
They might want that to be, but in a toe-to-toe -to -toe conversation, people are uncomfortable with unfair. Like people want to win, but not if it's unfair. Mm -hmm. Like you, know, you enter into a fight, one of you has an arm tied between your, lap, your back, like it wasn't fair. Winning doesn't feel like winning when it's unfair. Winning feels better when it was fair. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that also creates a level of indebtedness that says there is something in this for me. I'm not doing this work for free. Like this is us getting to a position that is purposeful at the end of it. So I think there's power in that. Yeah. I got to get to the affordability piece. And the mistake that many people make in qualification is like, oh, have you, are you pre-qualified? Mm -hmm. It's like a straight up direct question. It's, yeah, yeah. It is too much to be able to ask of somebody. We need to create a hypothetical scenario. Hey, if you were looking to be able to move forward on this, were you thinking a mortgage? Is this going to be a cash purchase? Um, are you going to be privately financing? Mm -hmm. See how that just curious open question is, oh, oh we'll need a mortgage. And have you decided who you're going to be getting that through yet? Oh, no, not yet. Well, would it help if I aligned you with an experienced local mortgage broker who understands this market better than many and might be able to help you with things like you know, quicker approvals and to make sure it appraises at the right kind of value? Would that be of something of use to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be super useful. Yeah. See, one thing that would help is that we had you pre-qualified before we went out to view, because then should you do like this, then you're certainly going to be taken more seriously than the seller. When it comes to the pre-qualification, is it going to be just in your name or is there anybody else involved? Mm -hmm. Ooh, what have I just found out? Mm -hmm. Who's wearing the pants? Who else is involved in the decision-making process? And it's not who's, a, who's wearing the pants, it's who else is involved in the decision-making process. Okay. Right? And they say, well, like it's my wife as well, we'll be going in this together. Sure. And I'd say outside of the financials, who else is involved in the decision-making process? Yeah. Well, like we need to have a home for my dog Rover or like I got two young girls or like whatever it might be, right? We get that story out too. But you see how it humanizes at the end? Yeah. Onwards from there. Yeah. And I think people get too excited that somebody wants to go and see a home that they miss this chance, not only for qualification, but for commitment. Like this is, we both know the rules and we've captured some evidence that says, okay, we're moving forward with this on purpose. And what I'm hearing you say is we're, we're looking through our process of qualifying. We're not looking to see if this person is, as we were saying earlier, ready, able, and capable. We're saying, can this, will this person, if they are all those things, commit to me? Yeah. Can we, can we make that connection? So let's, we only have about 10 minutes left here and I do want to take an opportunity to, to plug the book in a little bit here and, uh, and, and make sure we tell people where they can get the book. Uh, but I also want you, Chris, to turn the corner for us because I think one of the most difficult parts in a sales conversation that is oftentimes very poorly managed is objections. So everything's going really well. And let's flip the, let's, let's forget about buyers for a second. Let's move to sellers, right? We want to, we want to get our, help our clients get sellers and listings. Chris, what would be an example of comp, maybe one or two common objections a seller in a low inventory market might throw at an agent in a listing appointment? Yeah. Well, I think what's funny is you said, we're going to tell people where they can get the book. I think people know where they can get books, Jimmy. <laughs> I'd like to think so. They can get the book on Amazon. They can get on the book Audible. on Audible. All right. Okay. Like there's like a secret website. The secret. <laughs> we, have, we actually no. Hold, hold on. Hold on. Let, let me let me recover from that. Okay. Oh, we have bonuses. We're gonna yeah. tell people we can get the bonuses. Okay. We have bonuses. Uh, okay. We have bonuses. We got, got bonuses. Okay. So the objections, Phil, and I'll, I'll kind of, I'll try to keep this quick, but the, the objections would be, I like everything I'm hearing, but will you lower your commission? Uh, the objection would be, I like everything you're saying, but we're still going to interview one or two other people. Okay. Uh, the objection could be, you know, the other person has more experience. Okay. Uh, and then the other objection could just be, um, well, if you're at the listing appointment with a seller, th those are really probably three, like, 
they're interviewing and they're kind of shopping around. They want you to lower your commission. They're leaning towards someone that's call it, you know, better for them, whether that be a larger company or more experience or, you know, she's the one who sells all the homes in our neighborhood. So it would make the most sense to go with her. Okay. Um, funny that these objections are not unique to real estate, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, we're back to this model. Mm -hmm. We approach their situation with curiosity. Let's take the, well, will you lower your commission thing? Mm -hmm. So I respond with a question. Yeah, sure. Which parts of our service did you want me to leave out? Mm -hmm. and, and that in many ways will be done just to almost break the temperature of the conversation to help us realize we're having a value-based conversation. And, and I think there is an importance part of the real estate selling process that most, most sellers don't understand which is that the real estate agent carries the bulk of the expense for all of the marketing for the property that could almost be removed from them, from them at almost any point in time. Like the risk on selling this home is almost entirely on the agent mm -hmm. other than the time that could be lost, right? Financial time, effort, and energy is all on the agent. So um, I, I think we can then use other gateway questions. Like, did you want to do this cheap or right? Mm -hmm. What am I doing? I'm being curious. Help me understand what parts I've explained to you today make you think that we should charge less for it. But you have to have a level of confidence about what it is that you deliver. Like this is nothing to do with, well, the market typically charges X percent, so therefore I want to be aligned with the market. This is about you having complete confidence and conviction that says, okay, well, if I sell this home, I'm going to make $13,600. And I tell you what, I'm going to give you $13,601 worth of work, right? Like, like that's where the belief needs to come from. Mm -hmm. And I think even sometimes your confidence of being able to talk about money as boldly as what I just did there is a part of how you navigate some of those price-based objections. Curiosity enough to be able to say, okay, what is it we're dealing with? Empathy to be able to see it through their point of view, which sometimes is saying, look, I get it. Like everybody who's looking to have every major transaction is trained to say, is that your best price? Mm -hmm. Now answer me this, the, when you work with somebody who then lowers their fee, when you ask for a better price, how do you feel about the first fee? Mm -hmm. They say, well, I feel like I just kind of was working with somebody who wasn't being honest. So how would you feel if I now lowered my fee? Well, I'd feel like you were being dishonest. So would you like to choose an agent that is honest, straight talking and offers the same deal for everybody or somebody that's prepared to work with people that are going to bully them over price? Yeah. Well, I want to work with somebody who has some integrity too. Okay, great. Well, I'm happy we're on the same page. One of the, the principles that you just articulated, which is just maybe one of the most important things that I've learned working with you, Phil, around handling objections, or even just frankly having a tough question. And that is anytime someone gives you what is, what is perceived to be an objection, which oftentimes it may not be, Someone saying, will you lower your commission may not actually be an objection. They just, that's something that someone told them to ask. Right. right. So they're asking. And I think we have to, there's a story that we tell ourselves that is a narrative that oftentimes isn't true. But the principle here that I want to make sure, make sure our fans here don't miss is almost always the right way to deal with an objection is to either ask a clarifying question, Right which is just to, you're just trying to understand because now you really understand what's the truth behind that question as yeah. opposed to whatever the story it is you told yourself um, they meant. And I think that that little bit of a disconnect is where so much confusion and, and frustration that salespeople experience when it comes to handling objections. Well, the other person has to justify their context. Mm -hmm. Because if they say, well, look, there's another guy that I really like and he's uh, like 4% and you're at 5%. So I wanted to see if you'd match his fee. Then I'd say, well, what is it about me that makes you think that if our prices were equal, that you'd rather choose me? Well, I like your experience. I like the fact that you understand the area. I like the fact that you've shown interest in my, like, like the family as a whole and where we're going. I believe that you might be able to help me on the buying side of things as well. Okay. And help me understand this is, is 
what part of all of that do you not think is worth an additional 1%? Well, no, no, I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are you saying? Well, I'm saying I want to work with you. I just want to understand what the difference was between those two things. I said, do you now understand what the difference is? And he says, yeah, sure, I do. I say, I thought you'd see it that way. I'm glad we're on the same page. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if you ever lost a negotiation, Phil. So, all right, Chris, I'm going to give you the closing thoughts here, my friend. I'm going to I'll let you tell people where they can get the book and the bonuses and <laughs> how to install the Audible app on their phone. Go ahead, my yeah. friend. Well, the, the bonuses that we put together are actually really great. So the book is exactly what to say. And it really is about conversation, right? People, 100% of the people that read this tell us they love it. They bulk order it. They want to bring us out to do workshops and keynotes pre-COVID. We have virtual versions of those that we can do for companies and brokerages, et cetera. But if everybody goes to curator.com slash exactly, very easy curator, C-U-R-A-Y-T-O-R.com slash exactly. We actually have a bonus that's called exactly what your marketing should say. And what we did is we built 45 templates that are copy paste mm -hmm. for text, email, and social media. So these are basically taking some of the language and phrases from the book. I forget how many actual, is it 31, Phil? Yeah, we got to 30 on this. We got so much uniqueness that's in this book that isn't in the core book. Yeah, so there's there's more than 30. And we basically took those and turned those into Facebook posts, text messages, email messages. It's a free download, curator.com slash exactly. If anybody wants to bulk order, let's say you're a broker watching, you want a copy of the book for all your agents, you can just email us, email me, chris at curator.com. Anybody that doesn't have the book, I, I really highly recommend the Audible version just because, you know, Jimmy does a part of it. Phil and I did a part of it. There's a really beautiful field guide in here that people come back to over and over for those of you that are watching. And it basically is like, here's the scenario. Here's the objection. Here's exactly what to say when it happens. But we covered all that on the audio book as well. Phil. Stay safe. By the way, you're not going to love that porch in the summer. I know. Well, that's why I'm going to go back to England in the summer. <laughs> okay. I was going to say it's, it's, it's December. So you're loving the porch, but in Florida, we don't go on porches in the summer. I'm a part-time Florida guy though, right? I'm not all in like you. Listen, I might be part-time too. I've always wanted to be a snowbird because there's so many here, but anyway, Phil, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Jimmy, great episode. You guys can watch the replay on YouTube or Facebook. You can subscribe on Apple podcast or Spotify. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for your time, Phil. Thank you. Thank you.